Ah. <laughs> ah, at last. <laughs> Hi. Hi there. Um, well, I guess I should start off, folks, by apologizing for the <laughs> technical difficulties. Gee, where have we ever heard that one before? Of course, I've only been doing these YouTube live things now for a couple of weeks, so so naturally there are a lot of so-called learning experiences like this. Essentially, this morning when I scheduled this uh, live uh, for tonight, it seems that I clicked the wrong option, and YouTube was trying to connect to streaming software, which I do not have installed on my computer, rather than uh, just simply going live through the browser. Um, I know, short answer is get some streaming software. Uh, that's something I'm going to have to work on. Yeah, I spent the last, like, I don't know, 15 minutes or so trying to change that so I could simply go live, would not do it. That's why I had to delete that link and set up a brand new one. So I very, very much appreciate those of you who uh, took the time to uh, come and um, start up and uh, come over here. Oh, so having done that, to actually get going here. We are going to be doing a stir fry tonight. And this stir fry is meant as something of a celebration, apart for a very personal event that happened 10 years ago on this night. Um, it's not really that I'm obsessing with the date, uh, since it was kind of personal, but it's more like the date is very easy to remember because it occurred, well, the day after 9-11, on 2010. So it's not something. <laughs> so again, the date is uh, very easy to recognize. The short answer to that is that is the night when Connie changed my life forever. And I think for the better. Now, as for who Connie is, uh, a few of the folks seeing this or seeing my channel may recognize her as she is actually the wife of J.R. Bob Dobbs, the uh, founder, leader, and uh, sacred and uh, savior of the Church of the Subgenius, of which was very much a member of 10 years ago. Um, fair amount of what happened on that night, in fact, I'm not going to reveal here, largely because I am not the type of person who talks about other people behind their backs. At which point the chorus goes, oh, really? Yes, really. I'm sorry. It's just not how I do things. I will say, nonetheless, that it was um, a major uh, point in my life. And yes, there was <clears throat> a girl involved. Isn't that always the case? You know, you, you start messing around with uh, girls and lo and behold, your life ends up changing. <laughs> And I think it changed for the better. Those of you who may remember 10 years ago may also remember the girl who was involved. She is almost certainly not here tonight as uh, we not exactly had a falling out, but we parted our ways uh, a few years back, which is how things go. However, as I said, I am doing a stir fry in uh, memory of that. Um, among other things, it gives me the uh, opportunity, and of course I've got one other thing, here it is, do things like show off a nice little Santoku knife that I'm actually quite proud of. This is a Tojiro, uh, made in Japan, carbon steel uh, Santoku. Um, this is kind of the result of my getting into this antique kit since I learned how to cook. In that uh, several years ago, oh my god, I, I think it was actually like in 2012 or so, I uh, caught the carbon steel bug. Uh, for that, that, that means that, um, I need another bowl for this, excuse me. Um, I was... Um, really uh, learning as best as I could about a number of things, including uh, proper kitchen knives. As you know, for a good, stock, well-stocked kitchen, you need to have things like a good chef knife, a, um, a stock pot to boil water, and of course, a cast iron skillet. Um, I had only recently graduated to a really 
decent uh, chef knife, a Victorinox. But like uh, pretty much any foodie, I had, um, you know, I had seen some of those really fancy knives out there online from Shun or Global and so forth, and I was uh, saving up my pennies to buy myself a Global chef knife. When, uh, during the course of my research, meaning browsing on YouTube for things about cast iron and antiques, I stumbled across carbon steel knives. And something about them really appealed to me, maybe because of the, the fact that uh, they have to be uh, taken care of and uh, treated in a manner similar to cast iron, in that if you're not careful, these things will rust. Uh, and in fact, uh, because I just chopped up some onions, you can see this thing is already uh, get, developing a stain from those onions. So I better uh, take care of that right away. But um, yeah, it was something that appealed to me in that carbon steel, much like cast iron, has uh, really requires some special care to, be, to take care of. And that's one reason why I found I like it, because you do have to do a... Uh, special ritual, so to speak, when uh, using uh, carbon steel, and that means that in addition to washing the knife off, you have to be sure to oil it, which is what I'm doing right now. I've got a uh, chamois that I use, especially for uh, oiling these knives, and it's permeated with so much mineral oil that uh, I only have to uh, give it a dab of mineral oil like maybe every week or so. Anyway, this this thing's really nice, um, and I and I didn't pay too much for it, all things considered. I think it probably probably cost maybe about sixty dollars or so, of which it has been worth uh, every penny. So uh, I'm quite happy with that. <laughs> but yeah, that's the thing with stir fries. Um, of course, you really got to have your uh, ingredients in place so that you can do everything nice and. Fast. That's why I made sure to uh, cut up everything in advance, including uh, some broccoli and uh, some uh, beef and some uh, sliced beef, which I've been, which I've had marinating in soy sauce. Uh, well, now that we've had that delay, it's been marinating in, in this soy sauce for almost an hour or so. Uh, this was uh, simply a uh, round uh, steak. When, that I got cheap at the supermarket, but um, and normally, of course, round is not very good for frying. However, thanks to this fancy new knife, I was able to uh, cut this into very, very thin strips. So, um, especially after marinating, uh, they should uh, cook very well. At least that's my hope. Um, okay, let me also say hello again to the people who were kind enough to uh, show up here in the chat, uh, like Dana Ozar, Cool Joe, this got you into cast iron. Oh, yes, many years ago. My wife says I have too much cast iron, um, uh, to which you can say that you can never have too much cast iron. Uh, your wife's been talking to my wife. Well, this was, yeah, actually what happened years ago was in fact the first step down the road that uh, got me into cast iron. As I mentioned already, my life did change in fact 10 years ago on this night. At that time, I was still a geek who, could, who would have told you that I could not cook to save my life. So uh, even though my even though my life changed in a new direction on that night, it was a little while after that, maybe a couple of months or so, as I uh, began to learn how to cook for myself. The actual introduction to cast iron took place in, well, I can pretty much name the date, December of 2010. So I'm going to do something uh, on the 10th anniversary of that night as well, <laughs> my cast iron anniversary. However, now that I've talked so much, let's bring in some cast iron. How about that? And here we are. Once again, we have the Lodge cast iron 14-inch wok, which I have been heating up good and hot because for a good stir fry, that's exactly what you have to do, as, as if I really have to tell anyone that. And this is one reason I love this thing because it is so thick and so heavy, especially because I have an electric stovetop. I mean, I know 
they say that you're supposed to use a thin wok so you can toss the food around. However, this electric stovetop, you simply cannot do that with a thin wok. Um, however, on the other hand, with a uh, nice thick wok, this absorbs all the heat coming from the uh, stovetop. And so as a result, we get this thing hot enough to do a nice, decent stir fry. So I've been talking long enough. Let's get down to some cooking. And that means we start out with some nice uh, peanut oil from a maker that I can't even read the label. And we're and so we go. Fortunately, there are a couple of nice or, um, Chinese markets in my area, so I can uh, go. I can buy the real thing, so to speak, meaning imported from China. <laughs> and I'm sure some folks these days are not too thrilled with that. Well, I'll get into the politics some other time. Right now. I'm more interested in the cooking. And we get this good and hot. Oh, and here is where we bring out our next tool. This is, if there's anything I use in my uh, walk, in my kitchen that I could consider to be a magic wand, I think it might, well, two things. One would be my sabatier chef knife. The other would be this. This, uh, I think it may be vintage, a uh, nice, uh, also made in Hong Kong uh, wok shovel. I found this at uh, Brimfield for all of five bucks and it has been a really wonderful user. I very much enjoy it. <laughs> all right, so now that we've done that, let us do some stir frying. What we do is Okay, I think it, yeah, good, so we can see it. Take our beef, coat it in okay. cornstarch, and away we go. Yeah, why am I holding it? Right. Because it's so thin, this should fry it nice and effectively, or quickly, I should say. something of a legend in themselves in that in China and in Asia they, they've been doing stir fries for so long that of course they have there are a lot of legends and urban legends and myths surrounding the old stir fry to point where they talk about a mystical energy called the breath of the walk or walk hay which happens when you get to perfect stir fry. I don't know if I will ever achieve the perfect stir fry, but some of these have been pretty darn tasty and I've been very, very happy with how they turned out. So if that is wok hay, then I'm very much um, a fan of it. These strips here only gave maybe about, oh, I don't know, probably about eight to ten ounces or so of beef sliced nice and thin. Also, because I am nothing like a, not only am I nothing like a uh, professional or even a guy who works at a, uh, you know, at your typical Chinese restaurant. 
where they have uh, these blasting hot stoves with the rocket engines. That, and the heat in those things, there is no way in the world I could prepare that with my stove top. Which means this stir fry is not going to take 10 seconds the way they do. I'm still going to try to do this as fast as I can nonetheless. And is it Saturday or Sunday there? It is Saturday night here, in fact. It is a uh, quarter of nine on Saturday night where, oh yeah, it's quarter of nine on a Saturday night. So gosh, there's um, so many people there who just want to sit around here watching a guy doing a stir fry on YouTube. <laughs> well, for those of you who did take the time to do this, once again, thank you very much. But I'm actually, that's why I'm here, uh, largely because, as I knew, this has been a very, very busy day, and I was at my godson's uh, birthday party today. That giant cookie, in fact, was uh, pretty successful. I'm, I'm very happy with how that turned out. And because of that, of course, I was very tired and really did not feel like going out. And, and exhausting myself. Instead, I'm staying in and exhausting myself in the kitchen. Well, actually, that is definitely not true because uh, I've always found cooking, cooking to be very relaxing. As I've said a number of times, I consider this to be a form of meditation. Fool that I am. Meaning that it helps me to... helps me to focus, relax, concentrate, and zone out from the rest of the world, which I find to be very, very relaxing. You know, the fact that I have to pull these pieces apart show this is definitely not as hot as a uh, as that rocket stove you see at a uh, Chinese restaurant. It doesn't matter as long as it gets the work done. Maybe I should add a wee bit more oil. But only a bit. I'm not drowning and I'm not deep frying it. There we go. Now it's starting to look like a little stir fry here. Essentially, we do this until the meat is done, and I find that, that you can tell when it's done when you can easily. Cut a piece in half with your spatula. And that is not the case yet, so we have to keep going. Um, the, no the title of this video is Taboo Stir Fry, as in I'm breaking rules. Well, aside from the fact that I'm, uh, some people think I'm breaking the rules just by cooking on an electric, on a wok with an electric stove top with a heavy cast iron pan. That is definitely not how they do things. It also has uh, something to do with that with my previous life before that night ten years ago. In that, in some ways, I was very restricted and willingly so. I allowed myself to be led around by the nose by a person who, unfortunately was, well, let's just say, very much afraid of life, very afraid of change, very much afraid of pretty much anything new. And it what it really took was a visit from Connie to get myself the kick in the um, gonads that I really needed to wake up and walk away from that life which was what happened 10 years ago. But as I said, I do not like talking about uh, people behind their backs. So 
or details about the person I'm not going to reveal here on the internet. Again, there are some folks who may know uh, a few more of the details, which is fine. <laughs> but you folks really came here to see the cast iron and to see the cooking, not to see me whining about something that happened. Because, well, I'm not really whining, I'm celebrating. I have said a number of times, I think this was probably one of the best things that ever happened to me. Because among other things, as you mentioned already, it brought me down, started me down the road to cast iron. <laughs> so in a number of ways, I have Connie and Bob to thank for that. Now we'll just let this sear for a little bit more. Cool. Sunday morning here, Peter Briggs. Well, you must be in Australia then. Huh. Also, eat good. Well, to me, you're like the galloping. So, however, I did grow up in, um, in well, uh, I actually grew up in Marlborough, but I was born in Cambridge, and um, I had my dear grandmother live in Cambridge, um, well, really, her whole life, long before I was born. So we visited her on a regular basis, and I lived in her area for a good part of my life. Um, so I became very familiar with the Boston and Cambridge area, much of which I still remember. And it was a great place to live. If the rent hadn't become so astronomical, I would gladly still be living there now, where you, where you don't even need a car. You can just take the T anywhere. However, the rent now is, is out of this world. There's no way at all I could afford to live in, in the Cambridge or Boston area, sadly. Hmm. What state do you live in? So I'm, I'm still asking where, I'm, where I live. I'm thinking this must be locked up. Damn buffering, okay. Are we still buffering? Are we still buffering? Let me check. Let me go to my other computer and see what it looks like. I think we're good. Okay, from what I hear, we have just, uh, it's come back again. Sorry about that. Yeah, I have to get myself a Cat5 cable and run it into here, into the kitchen, so that I can have a more reliable streaming connection. I mean, this buffering has happened with each one of my um, live feeds, unfortunately, and I don't like that. However, at least, this is giving us time so that hey, it looks like we're getting to the point where this is getting done because I can take a piece of meat and I can cut it with the spatula. So I do believe we're at the point where beef is done. So I'm actually happy. So, one of the hard steps is done. This dark stuff is not, is not charcoal. This is the um, flour and um, cornstarch residue. So there is part one. Now comes part two, which is going to take a little while because broccoli is also a very hard vegetable. But it can, but it can indeed uh, be uh, cooked. And quite frankly, since the meat is done, I think we are past the worst of it. All right. Okay. So anyway, I'm not sure how much of that went through. Uh, I live in Massachusetts. Um, 
I live in Midstate, Massachusetts, in the Metro West area. Those of you who are in Massachusetts would know what that means. Um, I grew up in the Cambridge and Boston area, um, well, and so I'm actually very familiar with it, but unfortunately I do not live in that area now because I can't afford it. No one can afford it. It's so... the well, no one I know of can afford it, that is. Not with the astronomical rent they have out there now. All right, this is definitely hot enough. So now we get the next tough part, and that would be the broccoli. And why is somebody saying $50 here? I don't have any kind of a... Um, is that a spammer? I hope not, because I don't have any kind of a donate button that I know of. You use sesame oil. Uh, I have some sesame oil that I will be adding at the end of this, yes. Because that's part of the taboo. As I mentioned, in my old life, there were a number of things that I stayed away from. Again, this is all willingly, uh, because I was that much of a fool in that I allowed myself to be led around by the nose and willingly be uh, chained, not literally, but uh, figuratively, to a lifestyle where I was really something of a recluse. Actually, I am something of a recluse, but it's much more fun now. Um, and where cooking back in those days consisted largely of microwave, Walmart, frozen um, burritos and pizzas. Today. And craft dinner. And during those days, nonetheless, even then, I deep down, I had this urge to experiment, to, to try things with food. Uh, I did develop one stir-fry recipe, actually, that started out as this hideous mash of um, ramen noodles, canned spinach, canned mushrooms, and uh, canned corned beef, all uh, fried up together and buried in layers and heaps of cheddar cheese. Since then, I've long since improved that recipe uh, to a much more delicious spinach stir fry that I am actually quite proud of and love making because it's a really nice breakfast. It's, no, it's a take on corned beef hash. Uh, it's hard to find good cast iron from the USA and Australia. We can only get basic lodge pans. Yes. Um, Asian cast iron, there's really nothing wrong with it uh, as far as the cooking is concerned. If folks want to avoid Asian cast iron because of the uh, politics or because they have personal or political reasons, it can certainly do so. I'm not going to for force anyone to uh, do something that they really don't want to do. Um, so in, in these days, some idiot Trump supporters have uh, called me, oh, you're a stooge for China. How dare you support them? Uh, but no. It's because cast iron made in China is safe. And anyway, if you get used cast iron at thrift stores and and the like, uh, including Asian cast iron. I mean, it's not like your money is going to the pockets of those companies. It is instead going to the uh, thrift store and the like. Hmm. So. <laughs> However, now, now this is something I've been saying for a while, so. I don't know, I'm not talking about that, but anyways, yeah, keep going. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Hmm. Yeah, I guess I'm going to be having a political debate with Jamie a little oh, later. Jamie, you don't want that. Oh, 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 that. Oh, oh, I see, I see. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Just, well, you are not going to do a debate, but you. No, you know, that's no, that's true. Oh, because yeah. I because I said the dreaded word Trump. I got it. Yes, I did. I said the T word. No. Anyways, but yeah, keep going. That's all right. Yeah. As somebody says, Trump stooges are the worst. That was from one of the comments on the uh, live chat. Well, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, no. Okay, I won't get too deep into that. I'll back up from that, and I'll say again, nonetheless, 
Asian made cast iron, especially for you folks in Australia, if you if you find you need to use Asian cast iron, yes, you can do so as long as you know, because the cast iron is safe and it cooks just fine. Camp Chef cast iron here is actually pretty popular in the U.S. It's made in Asia, sold through a U.S. company, and it is very, very good quality stuff. At this point, I do believe we are finally getting close to uh, having this broccoli done, which means now we can, we're, we are probably more than halfway through this. Now we get to throw in all the fun stuff. Normally, stir-fry recipes don't call for red onions, but I like red onions. They add flavor, and they also add color. Now we get to caramelize these. How do you feel about nonstick pans? I feel that they are nonstick pans. <laughs> um, I started using cast iron. I caught the cast iron bug only a couple of months or so after I really learned to cook for myself. Um, like so many fools, up until my life changed, hey, 10 years ago on this night, <laughs> I knew next to nothing about cooking in that the pans in our kitchen were mostly from you know the kind that you get three for ten dollars a family dollar in the at the like and while those are supposed to be non-stick pans you know they last all of about i don't know two to three months uh how do i feel about non-stick pans well since i'm such a lover of cast iron i really can't give an opinion because I have not used nonstick pans very much. I'm betting that if I used a brand new nonstick pan uh, in the proper manner, you know, without metal utensils and the like, I would probably be thrilled to use it. And I like to think I'm open-minded enough that I'm not going to uh, diss it just because it's not cast iron. On the other hand, I love cast iron so much that I'm not going to go out of my way to use uh, nonstick pans because I like how cast iron cooks. I mean, I can get this nice and nonstick. I mean, as you can see, nothing is sticking here. I can make eggs and um, cakes and cornbread and all that in cast iron without it sticking, and it's uh, and I'm quite happy with it. Uh, Keith Brookshire, I'm really enjoying these live, live streams. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, I, as I said, I finally got the hang of this. I'm not going to turn this channel completely into live streams because, because you know, I spent all these years making these videos and learning a lot about video editing and production, which I find, which I'm hoping really is quite a useful skill. And it's actually a lot of fun to do so, following in the footsteps of uh, movie directors that I really admired. You know, Scorsese, Kubrick, and the like. Um, but having said that, you know, and of course, it's nice as well. This is it's a great way to fill time, you know, because I can do this. And now I've got another video up on the channel, so people will know that the channel is still in use. I am right now producing a, a uh, video to, that I hope to have released by tomorrow, um, part two, as it turned out, of the tortillas. Last time I made flour tortillas, this time I made corn tortillas. And yeah, they did turn out pretty good. So I'm actually happy with that, and I'll have that ready as soon as all the editing is done. Um, here again, I don't want to brag. Well, maybe a bit. But what I mean is... Um, a lot of these YouTube uh, cooking videos that are as amateurish as mine, you know, I do not claim to be a professional, but um, I like to think that my editing and the uh, subtitles and everything is a, a little bit better than a number of the other cooking channels out there. I cannot compete with a professional 
uh, cooking channels, the kinds with uh, six million subscribers, because they are, you know, use full blown production teams with a lot better equipment than this stuff I have in my apartment. Uh, I use ca uh, Oliver Garen Rounds. I use cast iron lodge pans for my primary pans, but I find it hard to cook scrambled eggs in them. So I end up using my non-stick pan. Ah, well, that's one of the most famous things, you know, as like, how do I keep eggs sticking in my cast iron? And the answer to that would be low and slow. You can indeed uh, do uh, eggs in cast iron, but it has to be at a lower temperature. If you do it, if you uh, put the eggs in a blasting hot pan, yes, they will stick which is why you need to turn the temperature down probably to maybe about 40% or so. You know, if your dial is 1 through 10, I would say like maybe 4 uh, or so would all you need really to make some nice scrambled eggs or for even fried eggs in cast iron. And now these onions are definitely softening, so I'd say we can now move on. Yay. Put this back in. The beef. Having done all that, oh, I think I made a mistake. I think I should have seasoned them before I put the beef back in. Well, I'll have to do it. That's my bad. So, now we get to finally add our salt, pepper. Garlic. And there's another taboo. I mean, why am I using garlic powder when I could just chop up some garlic? Yes, I could. I was going to, in fact, I honestly did not have enough time tonight to uh, chop up some, to chop up garlic as well in my preparations. I got home from that birthday party kind of late and I was kind of exhausted. Which is also why I'm using ground ginger rather than actually chopping up some actual ginger. Enjoy your past videos, you know, where you discuss particular pieces of your collection and the history behind them. Well, thank you. I particularly enjoyed the explanation of the of BSR handwritten pieces. Oh, yeah. BSR handwritten is one of my favorites, partly because it was discovered by Facebook. It was discovered by the Internet, by the um, people on that Facebook group for uh, BSR collecting. Uh, you know, a lot of the history of BSR was largely unknown to collectors, really, until the internet got involved. If not for that, not for examination and pointing out these things when they when they uh, cropped up, when they popped up, they would have just been really just unknown pans. But now we know about things like BSR's handwritten pans. We know that. Oh, let me get one. How about that? Oh, yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like this one, for instance. Uh, this is a BSR handwritten. Yeah, because if you look carefully, you can definitely see that this uh, imprint was uh, written in by hand and not using a standard um, uh, pattern, I guess, for the letter. Uh, yeah, and. Uh, both based on what we've found from history, uh, you know, from research and also just pretty much uh, guesswork, you know, using logic and the like. The conclusion is that these handwritten pans are most likely among the first generation of pans. How old is that pan? This pan probably dates to, no, almost certainly dates to the 1930s, maybe even the 1920s. So this pan is likely 90, 80 to 90 years old or so maybe almost 100 years old. So, um, yeah, when 
BSR first started. Um, there is an unknown gap in BSR's history of the in the early early twentieth century. They've been around since about 1905, 1909 or so, yet their pans only seem to date to about the 1920s. So there's an unknown period that we really haven't been able to determine what has happened, what um, really what happened during those years. Apparently there was even an enamelware factory that, that seemed to have burned down. However, at this point, it does look like we've got ourselves a decent stir fry here. I know that. And voila, we have ourselves a beef and broccoli stir fry, which we can serve over rice. Do you have a favorite pans? Well, all of them. <laughs> uh, well, Lodge and BSR and my Greenwald Dutch oven and my vintage 15 gallon cauldron and <laughs> you get the idea so uh, i guess it's really for the task for you that, that they're for i mean this lodge cast iron wok for instance i bought th this was the very first cast iron piece that i chose to make uh, that i chose to buy and i used an amazon gift card certificate that was given to me my, by my brother in Christmas of 2010. So in January of 2011, I got the urge and actually used that to buy this off of Amazon. So this uh, walk here is more than nine years old. It's 10th anniversary in my kitchen anyway, will be this coming January. This thing is still nice and hot here. Um, we've already been going 45 minutes, so I could either, uh, make some, uh, I could, I could probably make some, uh, quick fried rice to go with this because I actually have some rice for this stir fry. Um, or we could just answer a, uh, question or two and, uh, that should be it. So, well, actually, how about this? Let's, oh, yeah, this is hot. All right. Yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah. This, by the way, is a lid for a Wagner aluminum uh, Dutch oven, which I have really fallen in love with since I found that at Brimfield because it is the best water boiler uh, I've come across. Um, let me uh, temporarily move the camera around because this... Um, yeah, just right. There we go. Finally, this wag this Wagner Dutch oven here really makes some great rice. I love how rice works in a uh, Wagner Dutch in this uh, aluminum Dutch oven. Aluminum, of course, is such a great um, conductor of heat as opposed to uh, cast iron, which holds on to heat. Okay, let's get our shovel here. I can't hear you because there's a car alarm going off. Yeah, I apologize for the car alarm in the background, folks. Oh, yes. Yeah, that's true, too. But no, I'm not going to blame you because it's not true. Mm hmm. A little bit more oil here. And we might as well get ourselves some fried rice to go with this uh, stir fry. Uh, I was looking into buying the Lodge Legacy, but it's too heavy. I'm hoping the BSR Vintage one might be easier. Oh, the BSR uh, Fish Fryer. Um, the big fish fryer is a pretty heavy piece of cast iron. I will say that. Unless you're talking about the smaller one, which I suspect you probably are. The smaller, the, um, yeah, that BSR fish fryer, 
that actually is not especially heavy, but it is still a piece of cast iron that's like about 19 inches wide. So, and it's big enough to fit on two burners. So it's still not light. I will say that. Oh, good grief. Stupid. Thank you. Uh, where did I just put that? Here we are. Ah, yes. Fried rice. It does admittedly have the pan residue from that stir fry, but hey, that's going to add flavor. So I am not complaining about that. All right, since it just came out, it's freshly made and it just came out of the uh, pan, it's unfortunately a little more wet than your typical uh, rice that you would put into fried rice because usually that's leftover rice and it's been set setting for about 24 hours or so. So I'm afraid this does look a little more mash than uh, you know, than fret no than not fresh rice. I should have uh, made the rice in advance, but I didn't. So that again is my fault. Mm hmm. Uh, let me see. I love uh, Keith said for the responses. I own Griswold, Wagner, and Lodge. Haven't acquired any BSR yet. I love the BSR stuff. Yes, they are heavier than some of the others, but they heat more evenly and maintain and retain heat better. Same goes for Lodge. I have to agree there. I mean, I do own a number of Griswold pans, and yet I find myself preferring the BSR and the I find I prefer the thick, heavy cast iron, probably for that reason. I think it heats more evenly. All right, let's see what we can do to season this up. Here we go again with some salt. Papa. Little bit of garlic. Well, that might have been more than a little. Little bit of ginger. Now let's spread it around. Like it is starting to set now. It does not look as as much like mash as it did, which is good. It definitely indicates we're getting ourselves some the rice is actually cooking and frying. So I like that. So now at this point, let's throw in a little bit of soy sauce. As I mentioned, it's nice to uh, live near a uh, decent uh, Chinese market because that way when you want soy sauce, you get to use the real thing. Uh, don't worry, I do have another bottle, but I don't think I'll open it up yet. However, there is one other thing I do want to add to this rice because this rice, in fact, is one of the reasons why this is a taboo stir fry. As I mentioned, in my old life, I deliberately avoided foods that well, some people, they had a number of allergies, some of which I feel they may have used as an excuse, including saying they had a constricted throat, which meant, or so they said, that they could not eat rice. Furthermore, they also claimed to have a fatal allergy to sesame. So if that sounds like I'm being mean to that person, well, one, it was oh, 10 years ago, more than that, in fact. 
I am not identifying that person by name. I have no intention to. That wouldn't be fair. But there we go. We've got some sesame in this. So we've got some sesame, some ginger. And yeah, this rice is definitely frying up now. All right. In fact, from what I've seen, uh, Findlay seems to model their cast iron after Griswold. They're definitely the most polished ca uh, uh, cast iron. GSW is cruder. GSW, I believe that's Canadian. Or, oh, I see, you're talking about Canadian cast iron. Yeah. Uh, I don't think I've been lucky enough to see a Findlay or a Smart or a GSW yet. I know I live not too far from Canada, but that doesn't mean I've seen Canadian cast iron, especially vintage, unfortunately. All right, we are just about done. Let's throw the rest of this in, mix it in, and voila, we have our, in fact, I can even turn the heat off now, because what did I say about cast iron holding on to heat, retaining heat? So, yes, <laughs> uh, we definitely have ourselves a nice stir fry here tonight. Very much appreciate your patience, folks, as again, I was del unfortunately delayed by half an hour. I do apologize for that very much. Thank you very much for sticking around. Uh, we field, etc., are way too expensive compared. Vintage. Are you sure? I mean, you know how much a Griswold number eight goes for on eBay these days? You can often get it for more than $100. And I believe that's actually more than the cost of a field skillet. <laughs> yeah. Um, I had mentioned, you know, as you know, I have a Stargazer uh, cast iron skillet, which they were kind enough to send me as kind of like a promotional gift. And I've used it a number of times, and I don't like using it. I like its really glass-smooth surface and the like. Um, I had mentioned when I reviewed that, that uh, Stargazer that I had been given an opportunity to get a field skillet for free, and at that time, I turned it down. And boy, have I gotten a lot of slack for that. Field has a lot of fans here in this cast iron community, it seems. Um, so, but basically, I was such an idiot for turning down a free field skillet. Well, that was my choice, and I still stand by it. Uh, I turned it down largely because at that time I said that, you know, I really do have enough skillets, and I do not need another skillet. And I, and it was, I was in that position as well when I was offered the Stargazer. I decided to get the Stargazer, I will admit, uh, partly because its uh, logo, its star logo, has something of personal significance to me. As you know, the star logo on the Stargazer cast iron skillet kind of re reminds me of something that I use a lot in my uh, imagery. So, <laughs> Uh, flea market cast iron for me, and you, and I don't blame you at all. Any elusive pieces of cast iron that you're looking for? A couple. One of which is a BSR number 12 Red Mountain Dutch oven. I am lucky enough to own a Century Dutch oven, and, and I admit it's kind of like, I don't know if you'd call it ego or what, but I would like to get a vintage, um, Red Mountain Dutch oven because I have a vintage Red Mountain lid that I managed to uh, get from a seller. And the, that lid is really old and really thick and, I, and it would be nice if I could find a pot to go with it. The other thing I'm looking for, which I may never find, you know, not even if I look for the rest of my life, but no reason why I can't look, is an extremely rare... BSR camp oven or spider in the 
13 inch size, not 12, not 14, not 10, 13 inches because I have a lid for it that I managed to score from eBay. Uh, the seller had absolutely no idea what he had, and so I managed to get a fairly decent deal on that. All right. 20-inch lodge will cost around 52 Australian dollars. Um, I'm hoping $52 in Australia isn't really that expensive because that's a pretty good price for a 20-inch lodge. At this point, I really have to say, I think we are about done here. We've got ourselves a stir fry, which I'm hoping that uh, Jamie will enjoy, and myself. I mean, I, of course, I'm going to uh, eat what I cook, but I mean, you know, obviously, she, she, her taste is not the same as mine. But we'll see how it turns out. All right. I have one piece of advice for the viewers about cast iron is yes. this. Yes. It's just because the price tag may be super expensive, that does not mean it's going to be the best pan. Well, no, that's definitely yeah. true. As for like the star geyser, I found that the seasoning just doesn't stay on it very well. That's also true. And I had a hard time cooking. The black lock, the um the lodge black lock is my favorite. Um and I thought I was gonna like that stargazer because the, the the um the sheet in the pan, but it's just I have a hard time. You don't have as hard a time cooking, but um yeah, I've got a little but, experience but, for that. Yeah, so, but yeah. the price tag to me is just you know with how expensive it was. Just because a pan has a huge price tag doesn't mean it's gonna be that it's you know. I agree. Sometimes you'll find that. Oh no, know. I found I found a lot of my great stuff at flea market. For mm -hmm. instance, so I've got a couple of them in the, in the lie tank that I'm gonna have to take out and clean soon. Yeah, all right, but well, nonetheless, we look. are. Oh, yeah, <laughs> that's something I'm gonna have to show before we're done here. No, so get, close. Yeah, well, <laughs> no, no. Um, He's sleeping in the laundry bag. Mm -hmm. Maybe next time take it, but ask if they're okay if you with you giving it away to a viewer once you review it. <laughs> Yeah, that's tempting. I'll say that much. All right, here we go. We are we have ourselves a stir fry. I very much thank everybody for uh, hanging around. Um, I know I realize I gave some information about that night ten years ago, and I hope it didn't seem too insulting or too crude. Um, it was a major event that changed my life, and coming up. In October and in December, I'm going to be doing two more uh, live uh, ones like this. I'm sorry? Okay. Hmm. Maybe a bit. Well, I'll put this in the refrigerator. We can always have it tomorrow. I guess I'm going to end this. I don't know how long this is going to last. Besides, it's been an hour.